for the past you know, few weeks, a few times that I preach, we've been talking about our spiritual armor. And by now, uh, we probably memorized Ephesians 6, 10 to uh, 18, right? Um, particularly, we are talking about how we should put on our full, full armor of God. So in order to take st- our stand against the devil's schemes. <clears throat> and um, so we, we've been talking about, you know, this particular armor that, you know, when Paul was writing this, this section about spiritual armor, this is what he was thinking about. And um, we talked about, in, the, in particularly, we wanted to have the full armor because when you, go to the ba- when you go to battlefield and the armor is supposed to protect you, you don't want to just have one piece of your armor. If, you could, if somebody gave you the whole set, you probably want to put on the whole set. You don't want to just put like your wristband or you know, just wear your shoes and nothing else if you're going to battle. So the scripture tells us here, it says full, put on the full, the entire full armor of God. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to go into all the other stuff I already talked about. Uh, again, if you want to refresh your memory, uh, all the uh, sermons are posted on Facebook. So all you need to do, to do is go to our Facebook, type in Chinese American Family Bible Church. And if you think this will actually help somebody that you know, you could also forward the link to them. Okay? <clears throat> so today, today we're going to go forward with the second piece of our armor. Last time when I spoke, I talked about the belt of truth. So you see the scripture here when, it, when it's describing our armor that God gave us, our spiritual armor. It says first, stand firm with the belt of truth around your waist. And the second thing it says, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. So that's our second piece. The second piece is the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? <clears throat> so for a Roman soldier, the breastplate protects his vital organs, right? His heart, intestine, his soft stuff, right? So it's, it's very important. And um, what, the way that it protects, you see the metal there, it protects against slashes and hits to his vital organ, right? So if he doesn't have his breastplate on, he's really reluctant to go into battle because he knows he'd probably get cut up. But if he has his uh, breastplate on, he's, he has more confidence that he won't get hurt, right? So he's more willing to go, <clears throat> okay? Um, <clears throat> This, this is particularly a physical armor, all right? And Paul, of course, we talked about, he doesn't want us to wear a physical suit of armor to go out every day. He's just using that as an analogy to, to help us understand the spiritual side of it. So the spiritual side, he's talking about this breastplate, but we're not really interested about the breastplate itself. We're interested in about the righteousness part, okay? Because that, that's the spiritual armor part, the righteousness. So, you know, immediately some relevant question that we should be asking is, uh, what is righteousness? When we talked about righteousness to each other, what, what does that mean? Particularly, what does Paul mean by righteousness? And then if we figure out how, what is righteousness, then how do we put on righteousness, like an armor, okay? And once we get it on, how does this righteousness protect me? Some, you know, relevant questions to to this piece of the spiritual armor, just like truth, right? So to help us understand what righteousness is, we're going to go back. And one of the earliest examples that we have is Noah, Okay, and what, do, what does the Bible tell us uh, through Noah that we can understand righteousness? Well, let's, let's see. In Genesis, 
I know it's kind of small, so if you have your Bibles, you could flip there. If not, you could just hear me read it. But in Genesis 6, 5 to 10, okay, Genesis, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Genesis 6, 5 to 10. It says here, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race has become on earth and that every inclination of thought of the human heart was only, only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I'm going to wipe out from the face of the earth the human race that I have created and with them animals and birds and creatures that moves along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Okay, now why? Okay, so here, here's an account about Noah. And I'm, I'm not going to go to the full account because of the time, but I'm going to give you this first paragraph where it talks about righteousness. It says about Noah, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man. So he found favor in, in the eyes of the Lord. And here on the account of Noah, it says Noah was a righteous man, but he didn't just leave it there. It explains a little bit more about Noah. He says, the Bible says that, yes, Noah was a righteous man, but he's blameless. No blame, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. And of course, Noah has three sons. And incidentally, uh, I guess I, I just, because I'm always, you know, intrigued by this. But the way that we write uh, both in Chinese is a, it's a, it's a vessel with eight people on it. That's the character of a boat. And that's, you know, three sons, each has a wife, that's six people. Noah and his wife, that's eight people on the Noah's Ark, right? All right, that, that, that's just a side note. Okay, so, so here we see a little account about Noah. We also know that uh, Noah found favor in, in the eyes of the Lord. Um, the Hebrew word for righteousness, it's Sadiq. It means to be just, to be righteous, to be correct, to be obeying law or lawful, not breaking law. Okay, that's, that's the word for righteousness in Hebrew. So in, in this particular context of this story, we see that Noah was described as a righteous man, but it revealed that in, in contrast to all these other people, what is the, these other people doing? Well, they were being wicked. They were full of wickedness and full of evil. And their, their thoughts in, in their heart are inclined to be evil. So to be righteous would be the opposite of that, right? Wouldn't you think? To be righteous would be the opposite of being wicked. And that's what Noah did, right? Noah here, he's, uh, the Bible tells us he's a righteous man, but he's also blameless. That means he didn't do anything wrong where people can pick on him and say, look, you did that wrong. Okay? So, so here we have, a, we have an idea of what it's meaning by righteousness. Okay, let's go a little bit further in, in Micah. I've, I'm sorry, I, I highlighted these and I didn't even use it. <laughs> All right, so, so again, I was talking about how Noah was righteous and that he's blameless and he walked faithfully with God. Some key points of being righteous. All right, in Micah. Micah 6, in Micah 6, 8 through 16, we have a very similar scripture to what was said about Noah, okay? But this time, the situation is different. This time, God is not wiping out the entire earth, but it is a time when God is mad again with particularly here, the children of Israel. So let's see what it says. It says, God through Micah, God says, well, Micah says that God, he, God has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? He requires of the people to act justly, 
same thing as righteousness that we just talked about, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Repeat, right, of what Noah, Noah was walking with God. And he was righteous. Here, uh, the Bible says, God wants people to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with, the, with, with our God. Okay, so this, this part is what God wants. And then God says he's already shown uh, people what is good. So this other part is about what God is about to do, a warning. So it says, listen, the Lord is calling to the city and to fear your name is wisdom. He, the rod, and the one who appointed. The rod meaning he's about to spank somebody with the rod. Okay? Um, let's see. Here, God says, Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasure, you wicked house? And the short ephah, which is accursed. Ephah is like a, like a leader, like a bucket, a measure of volume. So what they're doing is in their business transaction, they say, well, I'm selling you, say, like one liter, but they actually put less than one liter. So it's a short ephah, okay? <clears throat> um, should I acquit somebody with dishonest scales and with bags of false weights? We don't use those weights anymore, but it used to be a balance. You put, like, you know, so many grams and you also put however many grams of uh, stuff you want to sell, and they should be balanced. Well, they put lighter weight. So then, of course, they're selling less with the same amount of money. They're cheating. Okay, and God's mad about this. Short ephah, dishonest scales, bags of false weights. This is what God is mad about. Okay? And this, this is in contrast of, of doing it justly, doing it fairly, doing it, you know, treating people right. It's not. This is not treating people right. And definitely that, that kind of shows you that these people are not really walking with God anymore. And God, of course, he will say it himself. Let, let me not put words in, in the mouth of, of the scripture here. Let, let's just read it. So the next part of this is, he says, you rich people are violent. Another thing against righteousness. You rich people are violent. Your inhabitants are liars. And their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat, but you will not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up, but save nothing. Because... What you save, I will give it to the sword. You will plant, but you will not harvest. You will press olive, but you will not use the oil. You will crush grapes, but you will not drink the wine. You have observed the statues of Omri. That's other gods. They're worshiping other gods. And all the practice of, of Ahab's house, you have followed their traditions. Other people's gods, other people's traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your people to diversion. You will bear the scorn of the nations. That's judgment coming. Okay. So again, here we see the contrast and we see that, you know, this, this righteousness seems to, like to be a big deal. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, I already spoke what I was going to say, so let me skip this part. <laughs> now, if, if righteousness is a big deal, wouldn't you think Jesus would have something to say about this? So let's, let's see what Jesus has to say. Let's just go to the first book of the Bible, Matthew, and let's just go down the list. All right, in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those with hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Further on in the Beatitude, still in the same thought, Jesus speaking, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, a little further. 
For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpass that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. A little bit further, Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Keep going. 6.33, but seek first his kingdom. We get that. We hear that a lot. Seek the kingdom first, right? But sometimes we forget. And his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then everything else that you need will be given to you as well. Further down, John the Baptist came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him so so jesus jesus has plenty to say right about righteousness <clears throat> okay let's go back a little bit okay so so here we see jesus uh is talking about john the baptist and and john is supposed to prepare the way of righteousness for people to eventually accept Jesus. So what, what did John actually do out there? How did he actually prepare? The way that he prepared, he, he says, what did he say? He says, repent for the kingdom of God is near. Right? He calls, calls out to people and say, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is near. And then when they do repent, he baptized them. But the thing is, he prepared by calling people to repentance. And what is repentance? In Greek, repentance actually means to turn around. 180. So you're going this way. Repent actually means to flip over, go the other way. And what that actually means is stop doing it the bad way or your way. Let's turn around and do it God's way. That's what repentance means. So he's calling everybody to start following and walking with God. You know, be regretful of all the sins that you have done. Start over and now follow God's way instead of your own way or the tradition or other gods or whatever that was bad. Okay, so that's how John was trying to prepare people for righteousness. <clears throat> so let's go back and see that righteousness from Jesus' mouth, Jesus says we need to hunger and thirst for it. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, we, we, we really need to try to do, to do our best to really go after doing what is right. Sometimes it hurts. And of course, Jesus knows that. He says right next to this, he says, yeah, you might be persecuted. People might not like it. You're going to do what is right, even if it hurts you. And people might not even like this. But still, that's what God wants. Right? Right here, it says, yeah, you're going to be blessed. Even if people persecute you because you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. What's a little persecution compared to having the kingdom of heaven? Keep going. <clears throat> he says to be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people. So here you see that Jesus is trying to tell people that righteousness is not a show. Politicians love to do this, right? They, they're like, oh, you see how great I am? I donated this much to this organization and now I'm doing this and I'm doing that. It's all very showy. To do right is how you live. That's the way you're supposed to be done. It doesn't care if people are watching or not, especially when people are not watching. Are you st stealing a little bit? When nobody's going to know. Are you going to cheat a little bit because nobody's going to know? It's not for show. It's not you do it only because people are watching. So here it says not to practice your righteousness in front of others because the goal is not to be show, to show that you are so good. You're so awesome. You're so righteous. Again, here we, we talked about already a little that we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay. But why do we need to seek? Maybe because it doesn't come naturally. So we need to seek it. Okay. Maybe because there's a difference. There's there's. Righteousness of the people, there's righteousness of God. Those are different. You can be doing something totally legal. 
but doesn't mean that you're right in front of God's eyes. How, how so? So let me give you an example. So let's say um, if somebody says, uh, well, I, I hired you, right? And I want you to just write down these numbers on this form, these accounting numbers, and you know it's not the right numbers, but he hired you, he wants you to write it, all right? So he, he's boss, so you're supposed to obey what your boss say. Legally, you know, he's the one who's going to get in trouble, not you. So if you do it, no big deal, right? Because he told you to do it, you, you're recovered. But it's not right. Are you going to be strong enough to say, sorry, boss, I know that's wrong, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Well, you're fired then. Okay. I'm willing to be fired from this rich, awesome, paying job because I, I just can't do it. Sorry. You know, so, so you know, one, one way, human righteousness, you're still covered. You're okay. But according to, the, to God, you're not okay, right? Because you just did something wrong. And, and remember the story of Joseph. Joseph was sorry about offending God, not because he's going to mess up in other people's eyes, right? You remember the story of Joseph, right, in the Old Testament. All right, so, so maybe, maybe because these things are different, that's why we need to seek. Seek out. What does God want? What is his righteousness? What should we do? Okay. All right, so anyway, we see here that Jesus does have plenty to say about righteousness. The next thing is, well, how, do, how do we put on righteousness? So from all of this scripture that I just shared with you, uh, one thing is apparent. Righteousness is not something that you have. You don't own. You, you cannot keep. You cannot have inside of you righteousness. Okay? It's something that you have to do. Micah says, what? To act. To act justly. That's how you put on righteousness. You put on righteousness by living righteously, doing righteous things, being fair, being just. Okay, and ironically, sometimes we feel like, uh, well, what if I just don't do anything bad? If I don't do wickedness, then I'm okay, right? Well, sometimes by not acting righteously, we are silently, silently giving consent to wickedness. That's, that's harsh. I'm not acting bad. I'm just not acting good. So is that Okay. I don't know. That's, that's what we all have to answer for ourselves, right? <clears throat> so, so definitely, though, definitely putting on righteousness is not to participate in wickedness. But to let wickedness go by, I don't know. That, that might be, you know, on God's level then. That's extra mile. Okay. So anyway, righteousness, what is it? Well, righteousness starts with treating people fairly, Treat them with justice. Don't take advantage of people, even if you can, even if nobody knows about it. It's to do the right thing, even if it's difficult. And even if people don't like it. So to put on righteousness, it's, a not, it's not about pleasing yourself. It's not about pleasing ourselves. To put on righteousness, it's not to show how great you are. To put on righteousness, it's what Noah does. It's just the way he lives. And it's him walking humbly with the Lord. That's what righteousness is about. When we walk with the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is righteous. If you walk with the Lord, you're going to be righteous too because you're going to follow the way he wants you to, to live. So, so we see here, righteousness, righteousness is an act. It's how we live, how we treat others, and how we do or we don't walk with God. Okay? Last part of this. So how, how does righteousness protect us? Well, we, we see already that God favors the righteousness. And the scripture tells us sin separates us from God. In our action, if we don't act righteously, if we don't act justly, we might have a choice sometimes 
that you only get to pick one or the other. You don't get to pick zero. You either act right or you actually act wicked. Sometimes if you do wicked, of course, you're not doing righteous. But if you're doing the righteous, you, can't be, you cannot do both. Right? You, sometimes in the situation, you pick one or the other. There's no, uh, I'm not going to do anything. Sometimes. Okay? So when we act wicked, we commit sin. When we commit sin, that att- attracts more wickedness. And the devil, if he got you to that point where you start acting wicked and you're attracting more wickedness to yourself, well, the devil has already tripped you up. He's already won that spiritual battle. But if we, instead of, you know, falling over to the wicked side, we continue to do righteousness, even if it's hard for us to do it, then it's easier for us to stick with God. It's easier for God to stick with you. See, Noah found favor in in God's eye. Wouldn't you like to be the one that people say, hey, Lorena found favor in God's eye. Or Carissa found favor in God's eye. You know, all his other friends are cheating on their test. But look, Carissa just study study her heart out and gets that 100 A by herself without cheating. You know, so God might have favor, right? In her, find favor with her. So when we want to be the ones that found favor in God's eye. So if we do, then let's put on righteousness. Let's walk humbly with God. Act justly. Love mercy. Right? And, you know, one one thing that really bugs me um, in in physics when I was in high school, this I didn't really get. You you guys all know about the north and south pole of magnets, right? Right? And then... In, in, in science class, we're told that, you know, opposites attract. And that really, really, you know, gets my mind going. Like, how does opposite attract? Like, right and wrong, would they attract each other? You know, that, that doesn't sound right to me, you know. So that, that really bugs me. But, yeah, north pole here, south pole here, then they come together. But if they're both south or both north, then I can't even put them together. They just keep going apart. But that doesn't sound right because, you know, wicked should attract wicked, right? And, and good people attract good people, right? Good people don't like to hang around with the bad people. The bad people don't like to hang around with good people because they're just goody to shoe don't want to do anything, you know? Don't want to party, don't want to have fun, you know, just stay away from me, right? So, so th- this bugs me, okay? But, but I believe the Lord gave me a new way of understanding. And, and it's actually in Scripture, too. So let's, let's look at that in um, uh, Corinthian. S- um, 2 Corinthians 6 to four, six fourteen. It says here, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. What does righteousness and wickedness have in common? The two doesn't have anything in common. What does fellowship, what fellowship can light and darkness have? What harmony is there between Christ and another false god? Or what does a believer have in, have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? We are the temple of the living God. And God said, I will live with them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. See that walking with God there again? So, so it sounds like my theory is correct, that, you know, like, like things, wickedness goes wickedness and righteousness go with righteousness. But, but this thing doesn't work on the magnets, or does it? So my new way of understanding is what's happening... Uh-oh. Next. Okay, weird. Ah, thank you. So, so what's happening is we see, yes, north and south, they attract. But w- what's the big picture? I, I, I think here's a new way to look at it. It's that this, this magnet, you can't cut it in half. When you cut it in half, there's still north and south. So it's, it's one piece. There's no only north or only south. So the reality of it is if you do north, south, north, south, 
It's the same. So you are aligning. So if you, if you think this is God and this is you, if you align correctly, north, south, north, south, just like God, then you can attract. You see it? So it's, it's a likeness. We're aligning in the same direction. It's the whole package. We're not cutting it in half and saying only the south goes with the north. You see what I'm saying? Maybe not. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just trying to say, if we align correctly, we get attracted to God. But if we don't align, if we flip it around, we don't align north-south with north-south. We flip it around, now it's south-north, then we can't, we can't stick. It doesn't stick. Okay? Now, another interesting thing about this is that you know, a piece of metal also has magnetic, magnetic particles. Just like all of us, believers or non-believers, there's a little bit of God's image in all of us. It doesn't mean that we all attract uh, the righteousness or we want to stick with God. So you see this piece of metal, it doesn't attract this other piece of metal. But if you take this and you help them align, this is another piece of magnet. And you do Bible studies and you go to church and you hear sermons and you start aligning, aligning up with God. You know, and then all the magnetic particles inside start to align. Now everything inside is north, south, north, south. It's not scattered randomly. So now, now it, it actually becomes magnetic. See that? It picks up the screw. Screw is just a big, heavy screw, so it doesn't stick as much. But yes, it's magnetic now. You see it? Okay, anyway, that's my little illustration. But the, the whole point is if we start aligning, Aligning with God. We actually are attracted to God. We now, it's, it gets easier and easier to do the righteous thing. It used to be really hard. Oh, do I have to do it? But after you stick around with God, you align with God, you don't even want to do the other thing. You, don't even, you, you cannot even start thinking about, how do I cheat on this one? How do I outsmart that guy? You don't even think that way anymore because you're aligned. And that's what I'm trying to say, you know? All right, so, <clears throat> so in conclusion, in conclusion, we, we, we heard about what is righteousness. We heard about how do we put on righteousness and how does righteousness protect us. So how does righteousness protect us? It protects us by helping us get aligned with God and repel wickedness. The more righteousness, the way that you live, the, more, the less wicked people is going to stick around with you because you're no fun. Wickedness doesn't want to come around you. And you repel wickedness. You attract righteousness. Well, isn't that good? You know? And of course, if you think the other way, if you think if you do something bad, automatically some people who do bad things want to be attracted to you. You know, if you're, if you're a gangster, you attract other gangster-like people, right? If you cheat, you attract other people who cheat. And they say, oh, that was a good cheat. But show me how you do that. I want to do it better next time. And I'm going to outdo, outcheat you. Right? That's how that kind of work. So anyway, this is a little bit uh, insight into righteousness. So with, with this understanding, let's all put on our breastplate of righteousness. And let's all seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen.